Okay, I think we're going to get started. Welcome to the presentation. Thank you for finding the time to be on. My name is Jesse Lehman. I'm the founder of Carrier, and we make the Carrier Absorbable B Kit for infection cases. And we're really excited that you can join us today. Since launching two years ago, Carrier Beads have been used successfully in a wide variety of cases all over the world. Surgeons are using the beads to deliver high concentrations of antibiotics locally to sites where infection is present or anticipated. The calcium sulfate in the kit is surgical grade and fully absorbable, unlike PMMA. And the sterile kit is easy to use and affordable. We are excited because today we have Dr. Heather Barron, Director of the Clinic for Rehabilitation of Wildlife in Sanibel Island, Florida, sharing her experience with the kit. At the end of Dr. Barron's presentation, we'll take questions. Uh, so please send them in through the Q&A box or use the raise your hand feature and we will unmute your audio. This webinar will also be recorded and made available at carrier.com. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Dr. Barron. All righty. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Jesse, um, and thank you, everybody, for joining me this evening to talk a little bit about wound management in some special species. So, uh, let's see if I've got everything going here. All right, so um, yeah, I hope uh, some of you guys have had the opportunity to maybe use uh, Carrier Local Antibiotic Delivery System. Um, I've used it a number of times and have been pretty happy with it. So I'm excited to talk to you guys uh, about it this evening a little bit. So let's go ahead and get started. First, I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about myself. Um, I am Heather Bear and I am the Medical and Research Director at the Clinic for the Rehabilitation of Wildlife, or CROW, on Sanibel. I graduated from the University of Georgia College of Veterinary Medicine and did my residency there and was also faculty there for a decade and was a tenured um, professor of exotic animal medicine there. I went from there to uh, um, St. Matthews University and the Cayman Islands and was also the veterinarian for um, Cayman Wildlife Rescue and also the Cayman Turtle Farm. And then from there came to Crow. And so I've been doing uh, special species medicine for uh, over 25 years now. So let's go ahead and get started. I uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the differences that we're going to have with the uh, some of the special species uh, in comparison to some of our companion animals. So usually with reptile integument, uh, their skin is usually going to generally be quite a bit thicker, um, usually drier, often less elastic, although sometimes with some species like snakes, it can sometimes be uh, a little more elastic than mammalian skin. Usually basically the skin is devoid of glands and the scales are of epidermal origin as compared to example like fish where the scales are of dermal origin. And of course, um, most of you probably know that the skin tends to invert as it heals as opposed. Um, and so if you want an apposition uh, as it heals, you're going to need to close it in an everting pattern. And that's why things like skin staples that naturally evert uh, the skin as they close work really well. Avian integument um, in general tends to be a lot thinner. Uh, most of the epidermis is only about four to 10 cell layers thick, um, although there can be exceptions to this. For example, um, on the legs of some species, uh, the epidermis can be quite a bit thicker. Uh, it does tend to be a lot drier and of course in general, much less elastic than mammalian skin. The dermis is also very thin. And so for that reason, you do wanna be cautious with the use of 
of topical medications because many of those medications um, can be very easily absorbed through the uh, dermis. And um, if you have systemic uptake of some of these medications, that could potentially be dangerous for the animal. You also want to be very cautious about the use of ointments or creams that may potentially damage the pelage and affect um, the ability of these animals to waterproof themselves or um, to allow them uh, to uh, control their own body temperatures. And so um, you can see in this juvenile osprey, uh, these feathers look very greasy and that's obviously um, going to affect the animal's ability to maintain his own body temperature. Remember normal body temperature in these birds is gonna be about 104 to 110 degrees. And so, um, and you know, in the average veterinary office, that's probably around 70 five degrees, uh, these birds are going to get cold very quickly. Um, the other thing that we want to do in wound management is, of course, to, uh, you know, be able to obviously um, clean around the wound. And when we do that, it is normal um, to, you know, pluck a few feathers around the wound. But we do want to minimize feather plucking because for every feather we pick, um, we're going to have an increase in the level of corticosterone, which is kind of the avian equivalent of cortisol levels. And with increase increasing corticosterone levels, um, we do get immunosuppression and delayed wound healing. And um, so when we can, we want to minimize that feather plucking. The other thing to be aware of is that um, the more distal that wound, uh, the more reduced the vascular supply is going to be. And so um, the more distal the wound, the more slowly it's going to tend to heal. And, uh, and so just um, bear that in mind uh, when you're dealing with wounds on the distal extremities that it may take a little bit longer and you may want to do things that may help to to improve vascularity in the distal extremities. And there's a variety of medications that may help with that. And you can do things like um, low level laser therapy or um, heat packing, things like that, that may help to improve vascularity in the distal extremities. Also be aware that um, birds lack uh, the bilirubin reductase. And so when they bruise, um, they don't make bilirubin. Uh, they're going to kind of stop uh, that heme product breakdown at bilirubin. And so they're going to bruise green. So um, don't uh, mistake that for um, sort of a gangrenous uh, um, product. Uh, so this bruising uh, green is um, fairly normal for them. Also, um, remember that uh, birds and reptiles um, have heterophils instead of neutrophils, and those heterophils um, lack that myeloperoxidase enzyme, and so uh, their pus tends to be very caseous. And so, in general, usually we don't use drains uh, in wounds um, because that's usually not going to work to um, drain the pus in most birds, although some birds um, will surprise you and uh, their pus can be a little more runny um, and sometimes I will use drains uh, like um and pelicans, for example, uh, and sometimes just to keep the wound open to allow for flushing. Sometimes I will use uh, drains, but in general, they don't work for us in birds. So uh, just some general rules of thumb in terms of wound management. And there's a lot of similarities when we're managing um, wounds in exotic species um, in comparison to our companion animals. So cleaning the wounds is much the same. We're going to go ahead and put, you know, surgical lube um, into the wound while we're removing debris around the wound. Uh, we're going to lavage with some type of warm, sterile, physiologic fluid. Uh, whether or not you add disinfectants to that fluid, most of the research that's been done shows that it really doesn't make a very big difference. So you can add things like chlorhexidine or betadine or silver stream if you want to those fluids, but it probably does not make a big difference. Where it would make a big difference is if you overdo it. Um, so if you are going to add disinfectants like chlorhexidine or betadine, 
um, make sure you don't exceed uh, you know the percentage otherwise you're going to get into the cytotoxic range um, so just make sure you keep it in a reasonable range um, one thing that um, has been shown to help is to make sure that you use a good irrigation pressure so ideally somewhere around 8 to 10 psi and initially we're going to be doing that about once a day and then gradually we're going to be doing it less often as those epithelial cells begin to migrate across that wound and um, we're trying to protect those young new migrating cells. Um, especially in wildlife, but certainly sometimes um, in uh, any species that um, even pets that may be living outside. Sometimes we have to remove maggots or other parasites. Um, certainly around the wound, you can use permethrins or pyrethrins. You have to be careful because some of these things can be toxic um, to these animals, and so uh, you don't want to overdo it. Um, know your species and know what's toxic in those species. Um, frequently I use Capstar and so um, I'll use the 11.4 milligram of the Nintempyrum uh, and 10 mLs of sterile water and then I'll irrigate the wound with that. Uh, you can also use um, Advantage. Uh, the other thing um, that you can use is uh, with most species, you can give ivermectin systemically for those maggots that maybe uh, you didn't find that weren't obvious, except obviously in colonians. So you don't want to be giving ivermectin to any of your uh, turtles or tortoises. Um, with a fresh wound, uh, the first time I go to irrigate it. I may end up using a little bit of hydrogen peroxide. Uh, remember, you don't want to use it more than once because um, that 3% H2O2 uh, can actually be cytotoxic. So um, you don't want to use it more than the first time, but it does work really well to help flush some of those maggots out of some of those deep wounds. Um, maggots will uh, actually bubble right up to the surface with hydrogen peroxide and it makes them really easy to pick out of the wound uh, so it helps with manual removal. Um, so sometimes I will do that the first time uh, I go to flush a wound. Uh, one thing you always want to make sure to do if you're going to be using uh, any antibiotic impregnated or carrier type beads um, is aggressive surgical debridement. So we don't want to use any necrotic um, leave any necrotic debris behind because um, it doesn't matter how uh, strong those antibiotics are. If you're leaving uh, any um, gross contamination behind, uh, it's, it, you know, it's really not going to work. And so you want to reduce that antigen load. Uh, you want to improve circulation into the area by removing all of that dead and necrotic material. And um, you want to uh, make sure that um, you're improving circulation so that you can get high antibiotic levels in the serum pockets um, as uh, you know antibiotics elute out from the beads and so um, putting beads into uh, you know areas that look like this are clearly not going to work you obviously want a good clean fresh wound bed um, to put your antibiotics in uh, once you have um, debrided and cleaned a wound, obviously there's a wide variety of dressings and bandages. Um, there are over 3,000 different types of dressings available out there, and clearly they're going to provide for um, all different types of uh, things. Um, you know, they're going to provide for hemostasis, protect new areas of epithelialization, keep the wound free from contamination, provide support, keep the wound moist. Um, for some species, they may help to absorb exudates. Um, most exotic species, the wounds are usually not particularly exudative. Uh, initially, for the first couple of days, they may help to debride the wound, and um, some of them may even be antimicrobial. A lot of these wounds, um, dressings and bandages, you know, really promise you the world. In general, I feel like most of them um, are not necessarily, uh, you know, created any 
any better than others. Um, to me, it all depends on what it is you're trying to achieve and then choosing the right dressing um, to achieve that particular goal. And so I, I don't necessarily think that, you know, there's any dressing that is, is so much better or that, you know, is the miracle cure necessarily. I think it's all about choosing the right dressing for that particular situation. And so you've got to choose the right dressing depending on the condition of the wound, the stage of healing that you're at, and the special needs of that particular patient. And so um, the needs, for example, of this, um, you know, peregrine falcon that had uh, a luxated elbow and um, was obsessed with his bandage uh, is going to be, you know, very different than this roseate spoonbill who would only eat if he was in water and kept getting his bandage wet. Uh, and so, you know, these guys had very different needs. And initially, um, you may want an adherent dressing for the first couple of days, but obviously then after the first couple of days, clearly you want a non-adherent dressing because you don't want to be tearing off um, those young, new, migrating epithelial cells. And then um, I think, you know, years ago, we used to all think we wanted um, a semi-occlusive dressing that would allow for good, you know, oxygen circulation um, to, uh, you know, allow that wound to breathe and that, um, you know, would, wouldn't uh, keep moisture trapped into the wound. But now we know that occlusive dressings usually lend themselves to better wound healing. And so uh, usually we want um, a more occlusive dressing in terms of permeability. Um, again, most exotic animals usually have minimally exudative wounds, and so usually we want um, pretty low absorptive capacities for um, our, our wound dressings. Um, again, when it comes to uh, our dressings, usually you want to keep our wounds moist. That is going to be the most important factor in getting these wounds to heal. Um, we need to keep them moist and whatever we have to have to do that, if you see that wound starting to dry out, you're, you're going to know right away that that is going to really impede that wound from healing and, um, and that's going to impede wound contracture as well. And so for the first couple of days, I love my wet to dry bandages, but they're not going to be any good for you after the first 24 to 48 hours in most of these species. And you probably don't need them at all if your wound is not heavily contaminated. So, um, you know, the first... Uh, uh, day they come in, especially with my wildlife species, they're usually pretty nasty. Um, I may have to do, uh, you know, some um, cold knife surgical debridement, and then to clean up the rest of that, I may want a wet to dry. Um, I really like to use like Tris EDTA, which is an antimicrobial potentiator, and then I'll usually use it with like a small gun, so antibiotic of choice might be something Thing like neomycin, so really, you know, a fairly weak antibiotic, but I make that into a super antibiotic by pairing it with this Tris EDTA, which basically weakens the cell walls of um, these bacteria and, and really makes it more permeable to the antibiotic that you're using. And so the first couple of layers of your 4x4s, you want to be pretty wet. And then the next few layers of your 4x4s should be dry. And so over the next 24 hours, they'll wick all that moisture away from the first couple of layers. And so the next day when you go to pull that bandage off, it should actually be adhering to the wound. And when you pull that four by four off or two by two off, depending on the size of your wound, it should actually be pulling those first couple of um, cell layers off with it. And you probably should get some bleeding when you pull that bandage off because this is a 
you know, a method of debridement. And um, it's meant to uh, be pulling um, some of that micro contamination away from that wound. But after the first 24 to 48 hours, you shouldn't need that anymore. And so after that, your, your dressing should be something like a hydrogel, um, maybe a, like a colloidal silver, like the Silvazorb gel I really love. Um, something like honey that you see here on this bird is great. Um, I think, you know, back in the day, um, a lot of us exotic animal practitioners used to use a lot of silver sulfadiazine. Um, but several years ago, I noticed that this really wasn't working well for me and that my wounds really weren't healing the way that I wanted them to heal. And um, Lara Cusack um, was my intern. And when she went on uh, to do her residency at UGA, they did a study on this in green iguanas. And what they show was that SSD actually delayed wound healing in green iguanas. And, um, and so I really don't use use SSD anymore um, or very rarely uh, in, in most of my wounds. Occasionally, um, I will pair it with um, something that is, uh, you know, fairly um, water resistant and I may put it on um, something like a, you know, a sea turtle uh, and, uh, and that um, will sometimes uh, meant to be fairly water repellent. So occasionally I'll still use it, but it's it's fairly rare I use it anymore. Uh, and so um, honey, I like honey. A lot of people ask me, well, can you just use like store-bought honey um, on a wound? And, and I guess you could. Honey is um, antibacterial in nature. It's very hygroscopic. And so basically it like dehydrates uh, you know, the bacteria, but essentially all honeys are not created equal. And so I, I really don't recommend, uh, you know, just honey bought off the um, grocery store shelf. Instead, what I recommend is um, medical grade honey. Medical grade honey has been through um, gamma radiation. And, um, and so that is going to make sure that it's not contaminated with um, uh, like any spores of like anaerobic bacteria. Uh, this is why they don't recommend feeding honey to like human infants because you always have to worry that, um, you know, this uh, may be contaminated with um, bacteria that may potentially uh, kill infants or um, cause uh, wound contamination with things like clostridium, which obviously would be bad. So uh, I really prefer medical grade honey. Also things like Manuka honey have uh, been shown to have um, exceptional antibacterial properties. Um, in fact, anywhere up to a hundred times more antibacterial than just regular store-bought honey uh, with this um, methyl glyoxal uh, um, antibacterial properties to them. Uh, it's also very anti-inflammatory. Again, just, just like any honey, it has a very high osmolarity. Um, it is very acidic. And what you see, particularly with uh, older wounds, um, they begin to uh, make the wounds um, very basic as uh, bacteria begin to get a foothold. Um, they'll begin to change the pH of the wound and make that wound a lot more basic. And so honey kind of um, brings that pH back down and makes it more acidic and actually produces very low levels of hydrogen peroxide. So not enough to be cytotoxic, but enough um, to actually uh, keep that um, pH more acidic and um, prevent those bacteria from getting out of control. Now, uh, you can have too much of a good thing. So um, honey isn't something you want to use um, 
uh, you know, throughout the, the entire, every stage of healing. So once you're beginning to see a granulation tissue uh, starting to form, then it's time to stop with the honey um, because you can keep that wound too wet for too long. So uh, once you're starting to get that sort of pink tissue forming around the edges of the wound, it's okay to go ahead and stop using the honey and begin to allow that wound to finish granulating in and start contracting down. Um, I love hydrogels. Uh, sometimes um, they don't keep the wound as moist as I like. So if you're using this Silvazorb sheet and um, you go to take it off and it's kind of sticking to the wound, don't just go ahead and rip it off. Um, go ahead and soak it with some sterile fluids before you remove it and, um, and it'll just gently soak back off. Um, but in general, I find if I use the Silvazorb gel, it does keep keep the wound uh, fairly moist, um, particularly if I use something that is uh, like gel impregnated, um, and it is uh, that um, silver impregnated is antimicrobial and uh, tends to work especially well on burns. Hydrogel bandages um, are also pretty good. These tend to form like an adherent gel uh, that um, tends to seal a wound. Uh, and um, things like suture seal work really well uh, for incision sites. So sometimes if I've um, done like a primary closure and I've got like an incision, like say in um, waterfowl or seabirds that I need to get back into the water right away, I will um, go ahead and put this suture seal over that incision site and then I'll get those birds back in the water right away like the same day of surgery um, I'll, I'll just go ahead and put them right back in the water and the good thing about this suture seal is it's air permeable but water impermeable so once I've cleaned up a wound maybe that looks like this um, especially on faces where you um, really can't put sutures or it's difficult to put bandages um, things like the suture seal seal are perfect because they're going to seal this wound shut and then you really don't have to do anything else to that wound. So uh, it's really great for hard to bandage places like the back ends of rabbits or um, on animals that just won't tolerate bandages, which is a lot of my wildlife species, or for like the perineal areas around rabbits, um, anywhere that you really couldn't put a bandage or that might be difficult to suture. And it's really going to protect that site and it will biodegrade over the next 14 days. And um, so I really like uh, the suture seal stuff. Um, and then hydrocolloid bandages, um, and one example of this is duoderm, and these are composed of a hydrophilic polymer like carboxymethyl cellulose that has a gelatin or a pectin that's going to interact with the wound fluid to form a gel and maintains a nice moist wound environment. And um, it's meant to stay on there. If it's looking good to you underneath that wound, then you can just leave it on there. There. And um, you can leave it for anywhere from like three to seven days. And if you think it's looking good, just leave it. Um, but if you think it's looking angry under there, you may want to go ahead and change it. And um, you do have to kind of suture it on. Although occasionally what I'll do with these, if I feel like it doesn't lend itself well to suturing, I'll actually tegaderm the hydrocolloid bandage in place and not use suture at all. So I'll just kind of tegaderm it on and I'll leave it there and as long as it's looking good I'll just leave it for several days and um, and it, it is going to kind of incorporate itself into the wound bed and uh, and then every few days I'll change it out and um, if it's if it looks like it's incorporating itself well into the wound bed then I just leave it there and um, anything that comes off when I pull the tegaderm off or when I remove the sutures that's fine I'll flush it away but if it's incorporating well, I just leave it there and put a new one on the next time I go to change it. 
Okay, um, that brings us to our antibiotic impregnated beads. And um, I, I'm looking over my audience here and I'm seeing that um, a lot of you guys have been doing um, uh, special species medicine for a long time, some of you for even longer than me. So um, welcome. I hope some of you guys are going to share your experience with us here at the end. Uh, and um, I know that a lot of us used to use polymethyl methacrylate beads back in the day. And um, I, I liked polymethyl methacrylate beads, but there were a lot of drawbacks to using polymethyl methacrylate beads. And I think carrier beads um, have a lot of advantages over the PMMA beads. So um, for one thing, they're fully absorbable. So uh, the bad thing about PMMA beads is that um, if you left them in, they would eventually potentially be a nitus for infection. So a lot of times we had to do a second surgery where we would actually go in and retrieve the beads. Um, carrier beads are fully absorbable. Another bad thing about PMMA beads is um, they actually had a high exothermic reaction. So we could only use beads that were heat um, we can only use antibiotics that were heat stable. Um, with carrier beads, there's a low exothermic reaction, so we can actually use antibiotics that are heat label as well. Uh, another good thing about carrier beads is there actually have been studies done that show that they are, are stable for at least 90 days um, after you make them up. And so what I'll do is I'll prepare them stably and um, sterily, and then uh, and then I'll put them in. Um, a sterile container and I'll store them for up to 90 days. And um, that is really useful because the set time is going to vary quite a bit depending on which antimicrobial you're using. So I'll use both antibiotics and antifungals for my beads. And um, the set time is going to vary quite a bit. And so for some of these, it can take um, an hour, sometimes even a little bit longer for some of these to set up. And so obviously I don't want to be waiting for that if I'm in the middle of surgery. And so being able to make these beads up ahead of time for my patients is really useful, particularly if I've done um, my culture on my patient. And so I know what antibiotics I want to use. I can make um, my beads up ahead of time for that particular patient and then do my surgery on a different day. And then another um, good thing about these beads over PMMA beads is because they're fully absorbable, they are going to deliver the full amount of antibiotics. Whereas with PMMA beads, they only deliver about 70% um, or so of the antibiotics you put into them because they're not going to be fully absorbable. And so those antibiotics are um, going to elude out um, from the carrier beads fully over about four to eight weeks, which is good because um, for a lot of things like osteomyelitis, um, it takes usually about six weeks um, for uh, infections to be um, fully, uh, you know, cured for things like osteomyelitis. The other good thing about calcium sulfate is it actually can provide um, like a scaffold for uh, new osteoblasts to kind of migrate across. So it is actually um, osteoconductive uh, for new bone healing, but it is also okay um, for soft tissue wounds. So there have been a number of studies done now that show you can use them in soft tissue and they are fully absorbed and uh, don't cause any irritation in soft tissue wound beds. And so um, this is us just, uh, you know, making up the beads and um, it comes, the kit comes with these, um, 
nice uh, rubbery um, mats and you just take uh, a tongue depressor and you um, spread uh, the paste um, out on the mats of the calcium sulfate, which is basically like plaster of Paris. And so that's going to be kind of the consistency of this. And once you spread it out, you've got beads that are either smaller in size or larger in size, uh, depending on the size that you need. And, uh, and then once your beads are set up, um, you can use them in your patient. And so uh, there are some, some sort of do's and don'ts that uh, um, I can tell you from my experience in using these beads. So ideally, you do want a culture and sensitivity. I can tell you again from experience, um, particularly in things like some of our exotic mammals, birds, reptiles, um, because they make that really cheesy caseous pus. Um, when you're getting your culture and sensitivity, um, sometimes you don't want to take it from the middle of those caseous abscesses. You probably kind of want to go around the edge of the abscess or even take some of the wall itself for culture. Um, at the very least, uh, ideally do a gram stain um, and get some idea of do you have more of a gram positive or gram negative. Uh, if you're going to go with um, an empiric choice, uh, then you're probably going to want to choose something pretty broad spectrum. Um, when you're um, filling some of these, uh, uh, you know, cavities of these wounds, um, you don't want to overstretch that area. So remember, each bead is usually going to elute out into an area of around um, two millimeters circumferentially around each bead. So kind of imagine putting each bead and giving it about two millimeters of space around each bead. Um, and, and that'll give you an idea of how many beads to put into an area. If, um, if those beads are uh, getting a little older and you feel like you need to re-sterilize them, you can gas sterilize them if you need to, but you can't can't autoclave them. Um, there are some antibiotics that will not work with these beads. Um, they just won't ever set up into a solid bead. And emrofloxacin is one of those things that, that the beads just won't set up into something solid. So um, there are some downsides. Um, the other thing is, is that I would be cautious about combining two different antimicrobials into one bead unless you have a study or you have some experience that lets you know that that's going to work for you. So sometimes it does work really, really well. For example, if you use tobramycin and vancomycin together, there was a really good study um, that showed that um, tobramycin is actually going to extend the elution of vancomycin out to 40 days. And um, for staph infections, uh, the recommended time um, for orthopedic infections is actually about six weeks of treatment time. And so, uh, you know, for an orthopedic infection, 40 days is going to be necessary. And so um, uh, this is one example of where using a combination of two different antibiotics um, actually, you know, made it uh, improve the performance of both. So, um, you know, depending on the combination of antibiotics you use and the size of um, the bead that you use, that is going to influence both your dish solution rate and your elution rate of your beads. The good news is um, there have been some good studies um, done in animals uh, that show that um, absorption uh, uh, does occur in animals. Um, for example, there was a study in dogs that showed that uh, in dogs with osteomyelitis, um, it took uh, the beads about five weeks to be absorbed um, in these dogs with osteomyelitis, and there was 100% resolution in these dogs of disease. Um, there have been some good in vitro studies demonstrating um, antimicrobial efficacy 
for a wide variety of antibiotics um, for up to 42 days uh, with um, some common antibiotics uh, in combination with um, calcium sulfate beads. So I just wanted to go through a few case examples uh, that I've had with you guys. And hopefully, again, um, some of you guys can share some of your experiences with us. Um, so this was a Kemp's Ridley sea turtle um, that had a net entanglement injury to the right front flipper. And uh, this constriction injury um, caused infection and tissue necrosis all the way down to the bone. So we went in and debrided away all that necrotic tissue, uh, and then um, we impregnated, we used um, uh, actually uh, um, uh, unison impregnated antibiotic beads, and um, we put those uh, in the bone, and then we closed uh, the muscle layer over that. And then we really didn't have, again, um, reptile skin is not very stretchy, so we didn't have enough reptile skin uh, to be able to close over the muscle. So instead, what we did was we put antibiotic impregnated beads just over the muscle here, and then um, we used uh, just some skin staples and then did like a tie over um, bandage on uh, the sea turtle and just used honey impregnated um, bandaging over the top of that and uh, and then just put this guy back in the in the water and uh, he was in a really good high quality uh, water tank um, at the high end of his uh, preferred optimum temperature zone and sometimes I think that's one of the most important factors in wound healing in these guys and um, and then every few days uh, we did a, a bandage change and um, uh, the beads, uh, you know, just uh, if they looked like they were absorbing well, we left them in. Uh, and then if it looked like we needed new beads, we replaced them. And you can see here, we kind of uh, lifted the skin edges. And if they were loose, we would um, kind of impregnate some beads up underneath the skin edge. And then once the skin edges adhered down, finally, you know, we, we just left them underneath there. And... Uh, this um, healed up really nicely. Uh, it took about six months, but uh, you can see here in this video um, that this guy had good range of motion um, on release here. And you'll see uh, in his underwater video, um, actually really great range of motion and minimal scarring uh, six months later. So he actually did really well. This was an adult male gopher tortoise, um, unknown history, uh, possibly, um, sometimes we get him in hit by car looking like this, but this guy actually had pain on him. So we think this may have actually been uh, a deliberate um, man-made wound. And you can see uh, we have lots of lung tissue exposed here, uh, lots of infection going on. Um, so once we debrided away all of the shell fragments, uh, it really was wasn't easy to flush this area because of all the exposed lung tissue. And so um, there was lots of microscopic uh, wound infection here. So we did a lot of uh, wet to dry bandages. But um, once we had gotten away all of um, the gross contamination, we still have lots of microscopic infection here. So uh, we did do a lot of carrier um, impregnated antibiotic beads and these pockets of infection. And then um, uh, we did also do a wound vac on this guy. So vacuum assisted closure, we used um, open cell foam, uh, pore size of four to 600 micrometers. Uh, and then we kind of cut that um, to the size of the wound shape, and then you used um, occlusive adherent dressing, so tegaderm. Uh, we just used uh, regular dental suction tubing, uh, and then we cut multiple holes in that to sort of diffuse the suction throughout uh, the um, uh, foam here. Uh, you can also uh, buy these ready-made through uh, KCI uh, with the trackpad tubing. And um, uh, we use just like a little honey dressing on this. 
and uh, this is what it looks like um, before we put the tagoderm on it. Um, remember, you don't want to use wound vax if you have any active hemorrhage or any gross contamination. Um, so you do need a fairly clean wound bed. Uh, and again, if um, as long as there's no gross contamination, if you just have microscopic contamination left behind, uh, this is where your carrier beads are really going to come in handy. Uh, and then we're going to change this wound vac after the first 24 hours, and then we change it like every two days, and then we go out to every three days, and then we do it like every five days, and um, and then uh, you know gradually just go further and further out. And these wound vacs are great for you know, large, traumatic, chronic non-healing wounds or osteomyelitis. And uh, again, you just want to keep this granulation tissue nice and moist and healthy um, with either honey or uh, the silver impregnated wound gels like we talked about. And um, this is a pretty large uh, traumatic wound, but uh, this guy actually did uh, really well. So this is what it looks like before you turn the suction on, and this is what it looks like after the suction is on. And um, it's okay to clamp uh, these tubes off to allow these guys to go out to graze or to swim. Uh, initially, when you first turn these wound vacs on, um, sometimes they act like they're a little uncomfortable, and, and humans will tell you too that initially it feels a little funny, but this is a very momentary discomfort it usually resolves very quickly. And there was a good study in small animals that showed that vac-treated wounds decreased in about 78% um, in size compared to only a 30% re reduction in size um, in wounds treated by traditional bandaging in a study in small animals. And so for reptiles that heal so slowly, this has really truly been um, a game changer. So back in the day, I might not have even attempted a wound like this um, because uh, the pleurosolomic membrane, you know, really just falls away from the inside of the shell. And um, if you can't get that pleurosolomic membrane to kind of, you know, come up against, uh, you know, the the inside of the shell, um, it's really not going to be uh, something that's, you know, going to work for this animal long term. But with with the the vacuum suction, um, this pleurosolomic membrane will come right up against the shell, and eventually you'll get a nice eschar there, and, and these guys will heal up beautifully. And so um, that is so important, particularly with aquatic colonians, because if you have a defect like this and you release these guys back into, um, you know, an aquatic environment, water is going to pool into these defects, and it'll be a chronic infection for these guys. Whereas if you put a, a wound vac on them and you're able to pull that pleurosolomic membrane to where it's flush with the inner surface of the shell um, and they get a nice wound eschar here that's um, nice and firm, these guys will do very well even without shell here. Um, a good hard eschar uh, is going to work just fine for these guys out in the wild. And any depression fractures need to be, you know, sort of pulled up. Uh, again, so that you can't have, um, uh, you know, water or any infection pooling into uh, these depression fractures. And uh, new bone growth can potentially eventually occur, but it can take years. And in the meantime, it's fine for these guys to go back into the water or be released uh, with these hard eschars in place. And that doesn't take long at all for these to form. Um, even with severe depression uh, fractures like you see here uh, with huge um, depression wounds like this. Uh, this only took about 48 to 72 hours um, on the wound vac for this pleurosolomic membrane to become flush with the shell. And um, with, you know, screws, um, wires, um, even plates, you can kind of um, put some pretty severe fractures back together. Uh, and um, with things like uh, this calcium sulfate, antibiotic impregnated, you can fill a lot of these cracks and that will allow you to get the negative um, 
uh, pressure wound therapy going because if you don't fill all these cracks in with something, you're not going to get that negative pressure wound therapy to work. So all these cracks have got to be filled in with something. And I like that um, antibiotic impregnated calcium sulfate to fill all these cracks in, uh, especially, you know, if you have to use screws uh, to kind of wire these guys back together. Um, I don't like to make holes in the carapace or the plastron unless I absolutely have to. I prefer minimally invasive things like these um, boot lace hooks or bra hooks. That's what I prefer to use, but sometimes um, you have to go in with bone screws uh, because it's the only thing that will hold these really severe fractures together, especially in big things like sea turtles. Um, and so, uh, but when you go to remove the bone screws, you're going to have defects in the plastron. And that's where I like to come back in with my calcium sulfate or carrier type material with antibiotic impregnated um, and, and fill those screw holes back in. Uh, and then I'll put a little bit of um, like either epoxy or um, like a, a marine epoxy over the top of that. And, uh, and then they can still go back into the tank until that's fully healed. Uh, and then once it's fully healed um, over, then you can release them uh, back into the wild. And uh, usually um, I'll put something called bio pads into these really large defects. Uh, and I'll moisten these with something called Silver Stream, uh, which is um, just uh, a silver impregnated uh, um, material until uh, and then put the wound vac on them. And uh, that's just antimicrobial. And it will really help to fill these defects in very, very quickly. And I think I have a picture of that on the next page. Yeah. So these are the bio pads. This is an equine type one collagen. And essentially, this stimulates um, proliferation of fibroblast and granulation tissue. And it's also hemostatic and it can be used with the wound vac and essentially it will absorb into the wound and it will help to fill in all of this dead space and um if you put the wound vac on these um, aquatic colonians uh, and um, you take it off after a few days uh, and the edges of the wound have kind of adhered to the inside of the shell, then that's great. This guy, sometimes what I'll do is I'll go in with a little suture seal and I'll put it all around the edges of this wound and this guy can go straight away back into the water because remember the suture seal is is um, air permeable but water impermeable and this guy can go straight away back into the water. However, if you notice that there's any gaps between the edge of the wound and the shell, then what you've got to do is roughen this wound back up. So roughen the edge of the SR and the inner surface of the shell. So just take like a blade and roughen it back up again until it bleeds a little bit and you can shove some more bio pad back in there and put this guy back on the wound back until all of that adheres back onto the shell again. And then um, put him back on the wound back for the next couple of days and check to make sure everything is adhered all the way around. And then you can try the suture seal again. The suture seal runs about $25 per application. It was off the market for several years. It has just come back on the market again, just in the past few weeks. It's back on the market again. So if you got frustrated that you couldn't get suture seal, seal just so you guys know it just came back on the market and you can now get it again so um, call the company it's now available 
and these bio pads, um, Angelini puts these out. These things are um, like gold. They work really, really well to fill in all these huge gaps that you'll see in these guys. So wounds like these that you're like, oh my gosh, this is a huge, huge defect. I'm never going to get this to fill in. Um, put these bio pads in, put them on the wound vac, and it'll fill in within like 48 hours. Um, it'll just it'll just fill right in. Um, and these guys are super comfortable with their wound vacs. Uh, you can um, use these smaller wound vacs and just hook them on to these turtles and tortoises, and they'll just walk around with their wound vacs. They're super comfortable. You can see these guys eating. The wound vacs go in the whole entire time, and you can tell they don't mind at all. Um, remember, it doesn't matter so much with turtles or tortoises because they have hard shells, but if you have a mammal or a bird, the foam has to fit perfectly inside the wound and not overlap the wound edges or you will irritate um, the normal skin around the wound edges. Uh, and then um, for anything that's free swimming, what I usually do is just put a swivel over the top of the pool and that will allow these guys to swim around normally. For waterproofing, um, it's hard to waterproof these bandages. Uh, I got a guy now that I'm struggling with this, but um, I'll use Tegaderm and then a little adhesive, um, cruise adhesive spray and really just um, spray the heck out of the Tegaderm or plastic. You can use Saran Wrap because I know Tegaderm gets really expensive. Uh, and then go around the edges of it with um, like the silicone, uh, gel that you use like around the edges of showers to make them waterproof. Uh, and then sometimes what I'll do is put a little of the fluorescein stain strips underneath the bandages. So if any water at all gets underneath and the bandage starts leaking, um, you'll know that the bandage is leaking because obviously you don't you don't want water getting underneath your um, your bandage because that's going to contaminate the wound. Again, and good high water quality water is paramount. Uh, so, you know, we have several different um, sea turtle tanks uh, and not all of them have UV light sterilization, water sterilization on them. But if I have a sea turtle with a wound, they go into the tanks that do have UV um, sterilization of the water because it's so important that they have perfect water quality. Uh, and so um, just bear that in mind. The better the water quality, the better wound healing you're going to get uh, if you can't get perfect um, uh, waterproofing of these bandages. So again, for aquatic colonians, if you have areas of bone necrosis um, or quote unquote shell rot, uh, what you can do with these guys is to breed these holes and then fill them with the carrier beads. Um, and uh, so, you know, make your antibiotic impregnated beads and then um, pack them into these little holes. And then you can seal that with this water weld epoxy putty. So you don't want the water well to go down into the holes. You want to fully fill that whole entire hole with the carrier bead. Remember that carrier bead is antibiotic impregnated and it is also osteoconductive. So um, you don't want any epoxy putty going down into this hole because that's going to prevent the bone from healing. Uh, and so the, the water weld is just meant to be over the top, like where the carrier layer is and that's going to prevent any water from going down inside here. So we want, you know, the bone to potentially um, heal underneath all this. And um, a wild turtle should definitely not be released back into the wild with any epoxy resins in place because um, eventually those resins are going to loosen up and um, allow water to migrate underneath them. And that's actually going to trap infection in place. And so we've really gotten away from uh, having any type of, um, you know, resins or um, uh, uh, applications left on wild turtles released back. 
Uh, these are, um, you know, just some, uh, you know, acrylics left in place for fractures. Um, and so as long as these guys are still in rehabilitation, these are all fine um, just to provide stabilization until these fractures heal. Uh, this is just some 3M electrical tape that's just going to provide some additional stabilization um, and uh, help with uh, any um, uh, hemorrhage and uh, some stabilization until this guy is fully healed. And what we'll do is um, put some of the carrier uh, um, antibiotic impregnated um, beads or dust in here and then seal it with the 3M tape uh, so that no infection um, gets into these cracks um, while these guys, uh, you know, heal, if, especially if they're in a semi-aquatic or aquatic environment. And this is uh, my third case. This is just a juvenile green sea turtle that was attacked by a shark. So big um, bite wound here with a nice depression fracture and then big bite wound here where it basically tore his hind flipper off. And um, we just went ahead and did a partial amputation here. Um, but you can see here uh, in this depression fracture, this is um, lung that's exposed and there's salt water just pouring out of um, the lung here. And uh, so um, before we can seal uh, this lung up, we're going to have to put a wound back on this and um, control this pneumonia. And then once we get all the salt water out of this lung, obviously this guy's going to be on systemic antibiotics, but we're also going to put carrier beads. And you can actually see um, here in this video, the salt water just pouring out of the lung and sea loam on this guy when we um, turn to, he's under general anesthesia in this video, so not suffering any, um, but you can see the salt water just literally pouring out of this sea turtle uh, after he came in from the wild. And that's clearly not a good thing, right? Um, and so before we uh, repair this fracture, we're just going to take our carrier beads and um, drop them all into the fracture before we repair it. And any soft tissue pockets after debridement, uh, we did a lot of antibiotic, um, sorry, we did a lot of endoscopic assisted investigation. So we went into the sea loam and actually uh, looked into the sea with our um, uh, laparoscope and put um, beads into any areas that looked like we had abscesses forming. And uh, then we filled in any uh, gaps in the shell um, with our antibiotic impregnated uh, carrier um, calcium sulfate here. And then over the top of that, we just put honey. And then um, we actually sealed all that up. Up, uh, with our wound vac. And you can see here, this is all wound vac sealed up with a tegaderm bandage. And um, once we uh, were done uh, with our wound vac, then this guy was actually able to go out in a pool. And you can see all the, again, all this is sealed with a uh, tegaderm bandage. And you can see our little fluorescein stain strips here that will let us know if we get any uh, water contamination. And um, this guy is actually in hospital right now with his little carrier beads. And he is eating and doing very well. And finally, for aquatic birds, I uh, just wanted to quickly say, again, very important that these guys go back into a pool as soon as possible. Uh, and so we always want to minimize feather removal and get them out um, as soon as we can. Uh, so for heavily contaminated wounds, we're going to do surgical debridement. Um, and then uh, after we debrid them, uh, we're going to culture for any remaining contamination. And based on our culture and sensitivity, uh, we're going going to uh, go ahead and make up our beads. Um, if we have to empirically choose, I'll usually use unison beads um, or I'll base it on uh, my gram stain if that's all I've got. Uh, and then I may place them on something like Xe because I want to be able to just turn them out in 
into a pool um, here in my rehab center and hopefully catch them up as seldom as possible. And then uh, once I suture them up, I'll um, close them with suture seal and then they go right out into a pool. If I have something uh, like this, um, I'll go ahead and debreed them. And this was a hook and line case where uh, the line was um, causing a lot of irritation to the commissures of the mouth. Uh, you can debreed this and then just um, pack loosely with your carrier beads. And then uh, just examine this every day. If there's any more caseous debris, uh, you can repeat as needed. Uh, ulcerative dermatitis is obviously a multifactorial disease, but it's really common in rehab if you're not working to prevent it. Uh, and then obviously, uh, again, these are all factors that can um, contribute to ulcerative pododermatitis. And uh, again, the foot anatomy of birds is really going to contribute easily to this. Um, any break in the skin can allow for infection. Staph is a common contaminant, but we also see a lot of E. coli. So a lot of times I will shotgun the um, antibiotics in my carrier bees because I know uh, the most common contaminants. Uh, and um, chronic cases uh, really do lead to walled off pockets of infection. And so this is where carrier beads can really come in handy. I also do a lot of regional limb perfusion um, with uh, these cases of pododermatitis. And I've found between the two, between my carrier beads and my regional limb perfusion, um, I am healing up pododermatitis um, so much faster than I used to. And really, in, in our hands, um, we almost always prevent pododermatitis, so we almost never have it develop here at Crow. But we do, of course, have um, birds come in that already have pododermatitis, or we get a lot of animals that transfer from other centers with pododermatitis. So it is something that you want to make sure you prevent, but if you can't prevent it, um, using carrier beads um, after you do your surgical debris mount uh, is really going to be very effective. If you can't close the wound with carrier beads, it's okay to put the carrier beads and then just bandage over and just, um, you know, change that bandage uh, initially every day, but then every few days and just repack the beads in there when you go to change your bandage. And it's fine to reuse the same beads. Um, if it looks like, you know, they're they're dissolving and you need new beads, well, that's why I pre-make the beads and then just store them sterilely. And I just open my sterile container, pour a few beads out, put them in the wound, and, and then re-bandage. Um, these are just a variety of things that I use to help redistribute the pressure necrosis. And uh, again, um, I will use regional limb perfusion both with antimicrobials and occasionally also with NSAIDs. And it is amazing after they've had that um, session of regional limb perfusion uh, with their antimicrobials and NSAIDs, um, they will feel better almost right away. Um, again, prevention is key, and I just wanted to finish up here real quick talking a little bit about rabbit facial abscesses because I think this is really where um, a lot of us are going to be using uh, carrier beads a lot in the future. Um, I think uh, we've struggled with rabbit facial abscesses and guinea pig facial abscesses and um, tooth root abscesses in general um, for a long time. Of course, uh, this is a huge problem in domestic rabbits. Um, luckily for me, not so much in wild rabbits. Uh, these guys do form very thick-walled abscesses and very caseous pus that doesn't drain well. And these abscesses can recur if the capsule isn't removed. And that's great if it's elsewhere on the body. But obviously, um, it's really hard to remove the whole entire capsule if it's on the face. and. Um, so uh, if you have dental disease, uh, if you have um, uh, a tooth root that's like impinging on the nasolacrimal duct, um, it, uh, it can be uh, really problematic. Uh, and uh, if um, 
you know, there's a lot of different dental instrumentation that you can use uh, to help solve these problems. Uh, I like using my endoscope to take a good look in these guys' mouths. Radiographs are a good diagnostic first step. So this is sort of normal grade one, uh, grade two, three, four, five. Uh, all these guys can look pretty bad. You can see some pretty nasty abscesses here. Um, and one study by Capello et al. CT proved superior to radiographs in 80% of cases. So this is straight out of his paper from his study uh, for diagnostic and um, prognosis of dental disease. And I think when you use CT for um, surgical planning, it's really superior and this will really help you plan where and how you want to use those beads and how you want to place them. Um, the use of micro CT can pick up even mild soft tissue lesions. And so, um, again, uh, you know, how you want to do that abscess excision and where you um, potentially want to place those beads, especially in alveolar bone, is going to be really important in planning uh, how to deal with these um, facial abscesses in these guys. Uh, when you go in to do surgical management, I think um, one of the most important things in having these cases be successful is analgesia. I usually use a combination of meloxicam and buprenorphine. I do use the cat Cymbidol in these guys um, at a dose of 0.03 mg per kg along with the meloxicam. Um, these uh, abscesses won't heal uh, unless you remove um, any dead uh, teeth. Um, or dead bone. So even if you uh, use the beads, um, if you have dead tissue, uh, even these, you know, magic beads are not going to help. And so um, make sure you debris away any dead tissue. Uh, again, um, you don't want to stretch the tissue, but you want to fill any voids um, with the beads. Um, there was a good paper uh, that came out actually a number of years ago where um, they looked at rabbit abscesses. And, and I think in general, you know, people tend to think that um, pastorella is always the culprit in rabbit abscesses. But um, we did a good study at UGA uh, a number of years ago that proved that pastorella is rarely the culprit. It is usually gram negative or anaerobes. And Tyrell found the same thing. Thing. Uh, and so I think, you know, when you're looking at rabbit abscesses, one of the important things to remember is that it is often um, anaerobes or gram negatives. And in the Tyrell paper, um, they found that these bugs are usually sensitive to clindamycin, penicillin, cefazolin, um, tetracyclines, azithromycin, ciprofloxacin, or metronidazole. And um, those are usually not the systemic antibiotics that um, we are usually using in rabbits, and sometimes for good reason, because um, many of these antibiotics, if used systemically, will cause a fatal dysbiosis in a lot of our hindgut fermenters. And so, um, you know, a lot of us are using things like trimethoprone sulfa. And so, lo and behold, systemically, uh, you know, those antibiotics are very safe, and there's, you know, very good reason to use things like TMS, but unfortunately with these um, dental facial abscesses, that is not a very good choice of antibiotic. And so I, I think the moral of the story here for these antibiotic impregnated beads is that if you use these antibiotics in, locally in these antibiotic impregnated beads, there is not a lot of systemic absorption. And so the antibiotics elute out very high concentrations of these antibiotics locally. And so they are very safe to use in these animals. And is there the potential for fatal dysbiosis? Well, there could be. And so I think you always should warn the owner of the the remote potential for that just to cover you, you know yourself but I think that is a very remote potential and I think that um, it is 
uh, going to be very effective in terms of dealing with the abscess. And I think, you know, the animal's potential from dying from its disease, from its abscess, from its tooth root issues is a lot higher than the potential of it dying from dysbiosis, um, from using these antibiotics that um, probably are going to cure its um, local disease. And so uh, I think, you know, there's a really good reason to think about using uh, some of these antibiotic impregnated beads locally. And um, I, I think it is really something to consider. And I think, you know, the PMMA beads really fell out of favor in using them in rabbit facial abscesses because they were causing um, a lot of recurrence of abscesses because they were, you know, acting as a nidus for infection and, and causing a problem if you left them in situ. And, and again, they were, you know, really problematic for a variety of reasons. And so I think we're really circling back around now to using things like carrier beads. And so I, I think, you know, this is very sort of cutting edge technology. And I think we need to look um, a lot more towards using these in the future. And so um, thanks so much for your time. I will turn it over now uh, to anybody who may have some questions. Thank you, Dr. Barron. That was excellent. We really appreciate it. Uh, we do have a, a question that has come in. Um, and you know, I'm gonna just pull that up now. So uh, Dr. Barron, how long do you store the impregnated beads for? So they can potentially be stored for um, up to 90 days. If you have any concern about whether or not um, those beads are still sterile, then um, I would uh, go ahead and you can gas sterilize them. Um, I know the kits, uh, you know, can be a, a little pricey. So, uh, you know, the potential to do the gas sterilization uh, is always there. And I think you saw um, how I uh, store my beads in the slide that I showed earlier. And uh, Tia asks, could you use the carrier beads and the plastronotomy incision? And Tia, yes, the answer is I do use them and my plastronotomy incisions, yes. I do. I use them and then um, I pack them into that incision and then I cover that incision with whatever I'm going to cover it with. And so if you're going to use um, whatever type of sealant you want to use, so if it's bone cement and because, um, you know, we always worry, I, I don't want um, my methyl methacrylate or, you know, bone cement or whatever I'm going to use to cover my plastronotomy and seal it, I don't want it going down into my incision. And so I like to pack something inside that incision because I want bone to heal to bone. And that's what that carrier, that calcium sulfate is going to do for you. It's going to allow you to pack that into the bone and allow those osteoblasts to heal, you know, bone to bone and stop anything like the bone cement from running down in there and preventing like the fiberglass patch or epoxy. Um, so yeah, things like you could do that. So you could put but pack the carrier um, into uh, your incision or your plastronotomy incision and then cover that with tegaderm um, or, you know, uh, and then you could put like fiberglass or epoxy or whatever you want to put over the top of that. Um, you can use the carrier beads while they're still soft. Yeah, you can actually just pack it right in there while it's still soft. You don't have to wait for them to get hard and then pack them in there. If they're already hard, Tia, and you want to pack them into something like an incision, just crush them back up until they're like a powder and then pack them into wherever you want to pack them into. 
Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. Here we have another one here, Dr. Marin. Uh, does carrier provide instructions for antibiotic concentrations in the bees? Yes, they do. If you do, like, if it's not in the kit, look on their website, and you will see instructions for a variety of different antibiotics and what the set time is for the different antibiotics. Okay. Um, I think I'm not seeing any other questions at this point. If anybody wants to send one in, please do now or um, raise their hand and we'll unmute your audio. I think that I think that's it. I think that concludes the presentation. Okay, uh, thanks everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, you know, please do not hesitate to contact me. Uh, anytime uh, via email or my mobile number. Um, anytime, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, ordering kits, turnaround time is usually same day. Uh, kits ship with a minimum one year shelf life. So you may want to consider keeping one on the shelf. And, um, you know, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Barron. Take care. Good night.